Maria, let me start with you, Maria. I'll get to you, Paul. I just want to talk about what Fetterman tells us. Mm -hmm. What do you think he tells us about the party, or does he not? Because voters in Pennsylvania weren't enamored with Trump or Biden, according right. to our exit poll. Yeah. But they got behind Fetterman. Why? I think there's a couple of reasons. Fetterman won against all odds. Uh, but I think it's four in the morning. <laughs> um, but I think it does tell us a couple of things. He actually, and I know that there was a narrative that Democratic candidates did not focus on the economy. Fetterman did. He talked about minimum wage. For working class voters, that's huge. He talked to the unions, that's huge in Pennsylvania. Working class, right? Harry talked about this, or, and, and everyone has talked about this, how he he's, has been able to make that up um, for white working class voters, which is a, a huge part of the Democratic coalition, has been historically, Trump won them, but for us, John Fetterman got them back. The other thing that I'm hearing, and you know I'm really focusing on and tracking the Latino vote, yes. Fetterman came, came out in support of so many of these policies that Latinos support, Latinos gave him three to one and gave him a big, big majority. Mm. And what interestingly Fetterman did during the campaign was that he focused a lot on his wife's immigrant story. Mm -hmm. And that really, I think, helped That's him out. What do you think, Paul? Yeah, well, uh, Maria is right to raise Giselle Barreto, the, mm -hmm. the wife of John Fetterman. She saved his life. She may have he saved his campaign. He said that tonight. God, yeah. God bless he said her. that on stage tonight. She saved the campaign then. She stepped That's in right. when, when uh, Lieutenant Governor Fetterman was unable to campaign. I, I get three lessons that all Democrats need to learn all right. from Fetterman. First, it's the working class, stupid. That's right. Just what Maria said. Harry showed us the data. You know, the Democratic Party, I've been saying this for over a decade, we're moving away. We're now, we used to be the party of the factory floor. Now we're the party of the faculty lounge. Mm. Well, John Fetterman is a factory floor Democrat, mm. and he showed, number two, margins matter. He campaigned yeah. in rural Pennsylvania, cut the margin. And number three, authenticity is everything. He's real. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people thought Dr. Oz was a fake and a phony. Mm -hmm. So, Mia, you've been talking a lot about, beyond who won tonight, what it means for committees in power. Right. So as we're thinking about who is going to be speaker, who is going to be minority leader, it's really about who's going to chair these important committees where the work gets done. Set because the agenda. The party, right. Who sets the agenda? It's the difference between Representative Maxine Waters and financial services being the chair versus Representative Patrick McHenry. Mm. So these are, I mean, this is where the work gets done before the votes get out, before you get, you get the policy on the floor for a vote. It, it's really important. And so Kevin McCarthy right now is thinking about all of these things. He's thinking about all of this. Are you excited about Marjorie Taylor Greene taking the contest? Uh, well, this <laughs> right. I mean, that's what that's she what wants Kevin oversight. Said. She right, and she wants oversight. Let's talk about let's talk about Georgia. Right. Okay. So it's your state, and we don't know what's going to happen to Georgia. There, it's looking more and more likely like it could go to a runoff. Talk, right. talk about that because it's unique to Georgia, and what you think the independent uh, in that libertarian candidate, rather Chase Oliver, who got a little over two percent of the vote. What does that what does that mean in a runoff? Where did those votes go? It, it, first off, it means all eyes are back on Georgia yet again. And what our current numbers show right now, Walker um, is at 48.7, Warnock at 49.2. So no one's reached a 50 percent. So more than likely, we'll go to a runoff. Looking at the history, being from Georgia, my old college professor, Charles Bullock, wrote, writes a lot about this. This goes back to the 1960s around the civil rights era. A segregationist um, representative from Macon was frustrated with the fact that African Americans voted in blocks and the white vote was uh, watered down and went across the spectrum. So he came up with a law that said you have to get 50 percent uh, or we go to a runoff. Fast forward to today where we have two African Americans that potentially could go to a runoff vote and enter uh, Chase Oliver, libertarian candidate who presented himself as the Goldilocks candidate. I'm not too red. I'm not too blue. Uh, but what it looks as though, and, and looking at exit polls from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, a lot of his voters mm. more than likely may go to Warnock uh, because they, they went to him because they were frustrated with Walker. They did not like Trump. Mm -hmm. So they went to Warnock. So if we go to a runoff, right. as much as I hate to say that, this could potentially benefit Warnock. A while ago, predicting a runoff, mm. potentially, Chase Oliver, <laughs> the Libertarian candidate, said... If a runoff occurs, it's a lesson to them. The majority party candidates of the top two candidates haven't been as responsive as they need to be. 
Watch closely. We'll get back to you guys very soon. Thank you, everyone.